My name is Soleil Gonzalez, and I am a proud Afro-Latina. My parents are from Cuba, and I live in Miami, Florida, where I am a director of corporate relations at NAF. I am really excited to have the opportunity to moderate Hispanics and Engineering and Tech presented by Raytheon Technologies. But before we get started, I'd like to provide some housekeeping reminders. It'll actually be a little bit easier if you guys, unless we ask you to, keep your Zoom cameras turned off for the remainder of the presentations. We will ask you to turn it back on when it's time to take a screenshot. Make sure that your audio is set to mute unless we request for you to ask a question. And to make viewing a little bit easier of who's speaking, set your view to speaker view. It should be at the top right of your Zoom screen. All right, let's get started. With close to 200,000 employees, Raytheon Technologies is defining the future of airspace and defense. But I can spend some time and try to explain what that means to you, but I think it's a lot easier if you'll just see it for yourself. What if we just made spacesuits and outfitted almost every astronaut since Freedom 7? That'd be a big deal. What if we just invented modern aviation and made the most advanced engines in history? What if we just created missile defense and guidance systems used to protect the freedoms we hold dear? If we just did any one of those things, it'd be pretty special. But when the companies responsible for it all bring together bold leadership, we accomplish even more. Like building eco-aviation solutions, developing contactless airport technology, and creating real-time satellite imaging to enable instantaneous identification of assets on the ground. Nearly 200,000 employees working together to create safer, more connected flight, intelligent space systems, and smarter defense. And of course, we still make spacesuits. Raytheon Technologies, the future of aerospace and defense. We would like to thank Raytheon Technology for allowing close to 300 NAF students the opportunity to participate in the celebration of La Cultura Hispana o Latina at Raytheon Technologies. Today, NAF students from across the country, including Puerto Rico, will get the chance to hear from dynamic Hispanic and Latino engineers at Raytheon. I would like to ask each of them to briefly introduce themselves, starting with Jasmine. Jasmine, will you unmute yourself, please? Yes, thank you, Soli, for the reminder. Hi everyone, good morning. My name is Jasmine Guerrero. Good morning to those who are in California on the West Coast and good afternoon to those who are on the East Coast. My name is Jasmine Guerrero and I'm a materials and process engineer out of El Segundo in California. Um, I was born and raised here in California, but my parents are originally from Mexico. I did go to college at UC Irvine um, in 2018. I graduated from there in chemical engineering and material science. And so I'm currently working out of El Segundo, as I said, and I currently work with the materials and process group there in innovating solutions with materials and going through testing uh, for a lot of our applications, both aer aerospace and, uh, and space. Juan Baena, would you like to introduce yourself, please? Yeah, sure thing. Bienvenidos todos, welcome. We're very excited to have you here. Uh, my name is Juan Baena, and I'm a current mechanical engineer at Raytheon Technologies. Um, I'm located at the El Segundo, California site, so that's near Los Angeles. I did see some California representation, um, less than 10%, but we're, we're excited to have everyone from all over the nation. Um, a little bit of just what I do is I work on GPS solutions, so kind of like on your phone, it's like Uber and Lyft but more so on the jet level and working for those solutions. Um, I'm originally from Arizona. I was born and raised there. I went to uh, Arizona State University for my bachelor's degree in mechanical engineering. And I'm currently getting my master's um, in aerospace engineering at UCLA. 
Thanks, Juan. Maria? Hi, everybody. Uh, welcome. I'm so happy to have the opportunity to speak with you here today. My name is Maria Campelo. Uh, my uh, parents uh, were born in Cuba, and I grew up in Venezuela. And I'm currently also living in the Los Angeles area, uh, working for Raytheon in the El Segundo plant. Uh, I have a bachelor's in electrical engineering uh, from Stanford and my graduate degree in electrical engineering also from USC. And I am a director of systems engineering for Raytheon. I work with systems engineers that are working to design, integrate, uh, test, and deliver uh, airborne radar systems for some of our uh, jet fighters, like the ones you see behind me, and also uh, satellite payloads. I'm happy to be with you here today. Thank you, Maria. And we have another Juan, Juan Cepeda. Buenas tardes or buenos dias. Uh, Juan Cepeda. Um, I actually was born here in California, a small town called Solving. Uh, my parents, mis papás, son de Jalisco, Mexico. Um, I actually majored in computer science, went actually to a community college for four years, then I actually transferred to uh, CSUN, California State University, Northridge where I completed my computer science degree. Um, I actually am a software engineer at Raytheon where I do electronic warfare. Um, the creative way to explain electronic warfare is imagine you are in let's say LA or New York and you have a cell phone. Well, it emits RF energy and you have other technologies that emit RF uh, energy like radio, TV, Wi-Fi, right? But what I do is I build small systems that try to detect that one cell phone in a dense RF um, environment. Um, yeah, we'll talk about that a little bit later on. Thank you once again for joining us today. We have received a lot of questions from students from across our network, and we are really excited to learn more about your journey to becoming engineers at Raytheon. Our first question is for Juan Baena. Why did you choose engineering as a career? Um, I chose engineering. Um, so ba back in middle school, back in high school, I, I always liked math. And being a uh, first generation um, engineer, I, my parents didn't know um, about college and engineering in, in general. Um, so I really relied on like my teachers and people that would visit that would come. And one of them, my algebra teacher, Miss Wellish, um, she was a past engineer in her lifetime. And she told me like, hey Juan, you know, you, you do really good on, on your algebra exams and your homeworks. And I think, you know, if you look at this career, um, it'll be a good fit. And from there, it, that's all it took. It took someone seeing your, your abilities and mentioning that me, um, my parents are from um, Southern Mexico, that you're able to, to um, pursue that and go to college. So after that, I started, um, going into more with that in mind and then I would join had, had physics as a class and um, I really like that like that projects applying myself applying those maths looking how carts can go um, building rockets with uh, two, two liter soda bottles and from there it just took off like the, the, the ability to really understand mathematics and um, take it on from there I, I applied to um, Arizona State University and again help with different mentors um, throughout the way. And that's what shows my path in, into engineering. Thanks, Juan. Maria, I'd like to ask you the same question. Why did you choose a career in engineering? I first started to think about engineering uh, because my sister, who is older than me, um, started uh, studying engineering. And I didn't know anything about it. I was younger than she was, much younger. Um, but it was around the time that the space shuttle was going into space and I got very excited about space and about creating um, all the systems that could allow us to do something like that. Um, as I went on into high school, I really liked um, physics. I liked solving problems. Um, I didn't really have a good idea of what engineers did on a daily basis um, and really didn't do it until I had a, an internship. Um, I'm a little older than some of our other panelists and, you know, back then um, there was no internet 
Um, so I, there weren't a lot of opportunities to figure out what it was like, but I like solving problems and the fact that um, in STEM you're creating, your whether, and it's the foundation for creating so many things, whether it's in the fields of healthcare or in communications uh, or uh, energy and the environment, anything and everything that, that you touch has been designed and um, innovated, tested, uh, most likely by engineers. Even for example, in the medical field, if you're getting a, um, a procedure, a scan, all of that um, technology that goes into it uh, is developed by engineers. And so I think that that was the exciting part about it for me is the ability to, to create, to create something. And it was hard at the beginning because I couldn't see it. We're going to talk a little bit more, I think, about opportunities for figuring out, you know, what it is engineers do on a daily basis. Thank you, Maria. Jasmine, what do you think is the biggest misconception about a career in engineering? Yes, I think the biggest misconception solely is the challenges that women tend to face in STEM, in a career in STEM. Um, there seems to be a sort of stigma on whether women can or cannot overcome uh, being able to innovate, being able to become creative um, and lead design teams on, uh, especially you know, for any of our products. I think uh, we're slowly but surely making progress to really be able to prove um, that there is some headway being made and being able to prove that our detail oriented, our curiosity, um, you know, female engineers, you know, really bring that value and is an asset to the organization. Um, along with that too is I, I was also a transfer student um, from community college over to a four-year program at UC Irvine. And so um, the challenges that are faced in becoming that STEM student through a non-traditional route of going directly from high school to a four-year college, um, it has a stigma as well. And even when I would go to interview with industries and companies, at a community, once you're out of a community college, there is a sense that you may not be having the full capability, you haven't had yet all the experience in your courses to be able to actually provide uh, value to the organization. Uh, thankfully, from my experience at community college through the MESA program and with um, SHEP, which are two, two, two organizations that, that are really close to me and that, that I vouch for, um, they, they really provided those outlets and experiences for me to build my resume so that I went upon transfer to UC Irvine. I had lined up a industry internship within Raytheon um, with one of their organizations. So, um, so, you know, sort of breaking the stereotype and being able to prove that no, well, community colleges, co community colleges do prepare students uh, to a level to perform and be able to contribute to an industry. And so um, that, that, that is what two of the misconceptions that I see, um, but I do feel the sense of change and that especially an organization like Raytheon Technologies really advocates for the diversity in our workforce and the diversity just makes us stronger. So I'm a strong advocate for both. Thank you, Jasmine. And I think you brought a very important point. Oftentimes kids or students may seem that, oh, if I don't go to an MIT or a Harvard or a Stanford, you know, I'm never gonna make it as, as an engineer. There's too much competition to be a strong engineer. And I think you are a proof that you don't necessarily have to follow that traditional path of an MIT or a Harvard or a Stanford, right? Uh, or a four year institution. You can start off at a community college and most students go to community colleges for a number of reasons, not necessarily because they can't get into a four-year institution, but sometimes it's for financial reasons. So I think it's such a, a, a great story that you share with the students for them to see that even if you start at the community college and you transfer onto a four-year institution, you still have um, the power and the opportunity to make it as a, as a successful um, engineer. So thank you. Thank you for sharing that story. Um, this next question is for Juan Cepeda. Juan, how do you surround yourself with the right support? 
you know, the right people that are going to provide you the right type of advice, you know, and that could be from a mentor, that could be from a group of friends, right? Um, especially if you are the first one in your family to go to college or, or even enter the career of STEM. That's a great question. Um, and I kind of have three points there. Uh, the fir- early on, I was taught um, at a community college. Um, I actually went to un retiro retreat on personal growth. And one thing I remember there is I was taught to put all my relationships, right? You have friends, you have family, acquaintances, all my relationships in four lists. You have one list that's the negative negative. You have another list that's the negative. You have another list that's the positive and the other list that's positive positive. And basically they told me, put all your relationships in those all four lists. And guess what? All the people that are in, in the negative list should be people that are not helping you. That are not helping you with personal growth. They're not helping with your career. That not, they're bad influences. And what you want to do is focus on the good people, on the, on the people that are on the positive list and bring them closer, right? Um, and that's what I did early on. Um, kind of starting distances, distancing myself from the negative people and bringing in those people that helped me that were kind of like-minded, which kind of goes into my second point. Hopefully everyone's heard, dime con quien andas, yo te re quien eres. And, and that, that also kind of strikes me, like surround yourself with people that you want to be. Um, I was never the smartest cookie in the room, but I kind of knew who kind of had their, um, I guess, chops, who kind of knew what they were doing. Well, I became friends with them. I studied with them, study groups. Um, And that kind of goes into my third point is there's a lot of people out there, right? That will help you. You just kind of have to look and ask. There's uh, MESA, Math, Engineering, Science, Achievement. There's NAF, there's SHIP. Um, There's after-school programs dedicated to STEM. Uh, There's maker spaces out there. Just go and ask. Um, So to kind of answer the question, how do you find these people? Begin to ask, go to these organizations. They will help you. Um, also find a mentor, right? Um, I've personally been mentoring a couple students um, and now they're working on Amazon, at JPL and things like that. So, si se puede. Thank you, Juan. Now we did have a question that popped up and this is going to come back to either one of you that like to, to further elaborate on this. What exactly is shape? You guys want to go into that a little bit more for our students? Yeah, I can kind of speak to that. Uh, SHIP stands for the Society of Hispanic Professional Engineers. Uh, it's a nationwide organization. Um, there's several actually regions within the U.S. Um, and they have actually chapters at high schools, college, and actually professional chapters. Um, and they have, they're known for their big annual conference uh, where uh, a lot of students go for interviews and for the career fair where there's a lot of companies out there. Um, actually, that's, that's how I kind of knew about Raytheon is going to those career fairs. Um, but that's kind of a little summary about, about SHIP. I know a lot of people, uh, me and my other panelists can speak to it too. Yeah, a little bit to add to that. Um, SHIP is also, you know, as, as Juan said, different levels of hierarchy. So of course there's a national, there's a regional, uh, you know, organizations, but the local chapters, um, there, there's also availability there. And I know that many colleges, many universities tend to have those, especially I think uh, Region 5 or Region 6 is over in the Florida and East Coast area. Um, and, you know, just take a look at their website, um, ship.org. Uh, they have a whole layout of what the regions are available. And it's very, very, it's a very strong cohort. It's a national organization that really focuses on on uh, developing the STEM pipeline for professionals and engineers. And so I highly recommend just to check it out. And if there's a chapter nearby uh, to just reach out, everyone is, is familia there. Thank you. Thank you for sharing that. So this question is actually from a student in Puerto Rico, Gianni Rodriguez. If you can please unmute yourself and ask your question. Yeah, I'm well. Hi, Gianni. Hello. Um, well, my question was, what type of jobs are available in engineering that most people wouldn't expect to be part of engineering? Great question. 
Thank you. Who would like to answer that? Maria, how about you? Sure, I think that's a great question because I think that uh, even within a specific field, uh, you can have um, uh, just uh, almost unlimited uh, number of jobs in, in engineering. For example, I was an electrical engineering major and all I really knew about electrical engineering was uh, electromagnetics, the kind of stuff that you learn in your physics class in high school and even in college physics. Um, but even within electrical engineering, there are a lot of things um, that you can do. Um, you can work for the large power companies and develop the large power systems that power the world. Uh, you can also uh, develop communication systems for cellular and satellite communication networks. And even within that, you can be somebody who is um, defining the system and coming up with what the system should be doing, or you can be working um, alongside um, companies that provide some of the components for it. Um, you can be working in the integration and the testing of that. You can be working, like as I mentioned before, on uh, developing um, new techniques for detecting uh, cancer um, using um, different kinds of, of waves. And again, the production of those types of devices for, for the medical industry. Um, you can be um, writing software for just about anything and everything. Maria, uh, I don't want to interrupt you, but your sound seems a little bit muffled. I don't know okay. if perhaps moving this, if you have a cell phone um, near your computer. And then also for those of you that remain on the call, there are zooming in, if you can make sure that everyone is muted while the speaker is speaking, that'll help as well. Thank you. Okay. Um, so all of those things are, um, you know, based on electronics. And the, the thing about uh, electrical engineering, or really about any of one of these STEM majors, is that what you think about doing today may be very different from what you do along your career. In my case, I started out with radar systems and I ended up in cybersecurity, which is a lot of software um, engineering and understanding how networks work, um, which was something I didn't even consider when I started out. So there are a lot of various things you can, you can think of in, along, even within a, a specific major. Thank you. Um, does anyone else want to add Juan or Jasmine to any of the other career options in engineering that perhaps um, Maria did not mention? Yeah, I can. Uh... I can add to the careers in engineering. Um, Raytheon, we have a lot. And when we go recruiting, we hire a lot of uh, majors, like if you're computer science, if you're mechanical, if you're industrial, if you're systems. Um, but really, it's, it's, I feel like um, anything that, maybe you don't know what you wanna do right now. Like let's say you wanna go into mechanical engineering, but then later you find out you're really into electrical. Um, you can definitely get like your master's in higher education then. And within Raytheon, what I really enjoy is that they allow that mobility. Like if you communicate that, if your skills and abilities align with that, then the company and their and your managers, they're happy to help you shift into that direction. Um, so for the question that what, what opportunities are, I, I would say for a company like Raytheon, we do everything. When, when you look at a jet, there's mechanical things, there's software things, there's electrical components. So there's a lot of things that we, we uh, account for and finding that strength is really up to you, to your interests, your abilities. And like I said, if you don't know that now, you know, every, every year or so you kind of learn, I'm still learning about myself too right now as an engineer. So those things will help um, cater to that. Thank you, Juan. This next question is for, for Jasmine and Juan Cepeda. We had several students ask, was it difficult as a Latino or Hispanic to perform well in school? Were there certain subjects that were a little bit more challenging than others or develop your career in engineering? Yes, I can start off uh, the conversation on that one. And it 
Engineering is hard. Yes. Um, I think many of us starting off with the first uh, class set of classes, um, it takes some organization, some time management skills, and just in terms of um, understanding and learning, it does take plenty of dedication. But that being said, um, there, there is no obstacle that one can't overcome, you know, as long as you set your mindset and have uh, the organization uh, involved to do it. I think, um, you know, that's, that's not to discourage, um, you know, any students in engineering. I feel like if there's a passion or a curiosity developed for um, an interest, then you can definitely um, overcome and, and, and complete it. Um, that being said, I think uh, the challenges sometimes are, are presented themselves as cultural, cultural as well. Um, so oftentimes for me as a Latina first uh, generation college student was the issue of you know, leaving home to go to college, leaving home from Santa Barbara to uh, Irvine. It's about two or three hours of a drive or a commute, not too far, it's not across the country, but um, it does make a difference for you know, family life, your parents, um, and, and just in general, uh, familia. I think uh, as Hispanics, we definitely like to stay as close to home as possible, or we like to stay within our, our nest. Um, but sometimes we just need to grow our wings and, and, and spread and, and, and grow. And so in order to rise up to the challenges, rise up to the next level of opportunities, um, I think we definitely have to step aside and, and, and take on uh, that, that, that fear potentially, or that uh, you know, new challenge. I don't know if Juan would like to add more to that. Uh, yeah, I can, I can speak to that. Was it difficult? Um, yes. Uh, just to give you an example, um, I, at a high school, I wasn't really good at math. I wasn't really good at science, but I loved computers. Um, so that's how I kind of entered in the computer science field. And um, I remember during community college, it took me four years. Usually they said, oh, it's four years to in and out, right? But in the community college, I was there for four years. Um, I actually failed uh, three math classes. I actually got Fs in them. Um, but I kept pushing forward. Um, hard work does pay off. Um, and um, is it hard? Yes, you're going to have long nights. Um, I'm not going to sugarcoat it. You're going to have long nights. You're going to sometimes be at the library stuck uh, studying. But everything, it, it's all worth it at the end. Um, and um, I can't just begin to explain how much it's worth it because um, like, yeah, I was a dishwasher. My parents um, is a gardener. My mom is a housekeeper. Um, yeah, during high school, I was cleaning dishes and stuff. Who would have thought now I'm an engineer building um, things that, that first systems that fly and, and actually going and testing on that. Like I would have never thought of it, but hard work pays off. You see, vale la pena. Thank you, Juan and Jasmine. This next question is actually from Miami, Florida, and it's from Luis Castellano. Luis, can you please unmute yourself and ask your question? Um, what advice would you give to minorities who aspire a career as complex as engineering? I can, uh, I can start that one off. So, uh... Thank you for that question. I think that's a really relatable one, especially to me. And one thing that um, Juan and Jasmine mentioned was about SHIP. And a lot of opportunities start out at high school, um, at the college level. And for me, like when I joined college, um, it was hard. Like, you know, I, I, I took uh, math courses in high school, but the math courses that you take in college are like next level. So definitely I needed some support there. And when I joined um, organizations like SHIP, um, kind of like Jasmine mentioned, there's their own group there. And they're all, they all have the same mission and background. So there, a lot of them are Latinos. Um, a lot of them want to pursue engineering. And once you, once you join that organization, you're able to create study groups and support systems, which is very helpful because now, now you're surrounding yourself with people that are okay with studying on, the, on a Saturday. They're okay with um, 
making sure they they understand the concepts, they do the homeworks. And at the at the same time, interested about the the same thing, like maybe some of the hobbies is building something. Um, and th they're all the same background, so they all relatable. And that's how I found it that I was able to do well and um, in college because it was such an unknown thing. Like I, I couldn't come to my family with like any of the homework assignment just because they didn't know anything about it. But things like that, just getting involved, you know, take, it might be a little bit uncomfortable at first because you're putting yourself out there. You're, you're putting yourself that you don't know this material, et cetera. But once, once you put yourself there and people will support you. So that's what I do recommend. Thank you, Juan. Um, this next question is for Maria and Juan Cepeda. How important is diversity of thought to creating, building, and developing innovative products as an engineer? And for a company like Raytheon. I'll start on if it's okay with you. Uh, diversity is very important and diversity of thought especially is very important. Um, Raytheon, we work together in teams. It's all about working together as a group, uh, we have teams of um, engineers that have uh, different backgrounds. So they are mechanical, electrical, computer science, material science, um, and they all have to come together because large complex systems like the ones that we build at Raytheon, you know, require a lot of, uh, a lot of engineers. To, to bring it together all the way from the initial concept to when it gets deployed. And so these groups have to work well together and part of that is uh, valuing that diversity of thought, the different opinions that the employees on the team have, um, the different ideas that they bring and they bring these different ideas to the table based on their different backgrounds, whether it's educational background, but also other ways of approaching problems because the big thing about engineering too is that you're a problem solver. Once you are a STEM uh, graduate, you're an engineer you know, or a scientist for the rest of your life. And no matter what you do and what you decide to do with that, and it will change over the course of your career, that problem solving orientation, that mentality is gonna follow you and serve you well no matter what you do. But so the people have different approaches to solving problems. So that diversity of thought is, is very, very important. And I think us as Hispanics, um, as Latinos, we bring that because we're from all different countries, um, different uh, cultures within uh, the Latin American world. And we come together as a group. So we, we have that foundation very important that diversity of thought. Thank you, Maria. I know we were having still a little bit of audio issues, so I'd like to ask um, if Juan Cepeda or Juan Baena would like to, or even Jasmine would like to add a little bit more to the importance of diversity of thought, of, of diversity of, of design and innovation. Yeah, I can quickly kind of go and I'm gonna answer it a little bit different. Um, what happens if we don't have diversity? Um, Recently, there was two incidents um, in the software world um, via Google and Apple that, for example, Google released their photo recognition um, kind of software. And they're supposed to ID people, right? You're between like me and my sister. Um, but their photo recognition software were actually detecting, um, uh, unfortunately, black people as gorillas because they're uh, software, their, their engineers, their data wasn't as diverse as it could be. It wasn't, it didn't represent the population they were serving. Another example is Apple where everyone has a smartwatch, right? Um, usually it says, oh, it's time to get up, right? And uh, go walk around. So you're not sitting at your computer all the time. Well, um, they had smartwatches that were telling handicapped people to stand up, that they couldn't get up. And why? Because they didn't have that diversity in there. So diversity in everything, right? In thought and ideas, um, you have to ha represent what the population you're serving. Um, everybody, right? Um, 
And the more you have that diversity, um, the better product you will build. Um, and just different ways of solving problems. Um, so I'll just leave it at that if my other colleagues want to speak in. I think that's yeah, I think that's important. Important. Go ahead, Jasmine. Oh, no, I was just going to say that that pretty much covers it because I think, um, you know, there's so many uh, customers out there and what their needs are uh, can be very niche sometimes. Um, and, and in order to serve and to cater to everyone's needs, um, you know, especially in the consumer side, as the examples that uh, Juan Cepeda was, was speaking to is, is definitely essential. But I think, um, you know, as, as the needs become more complex for the applications that Raytheon has, um, you know, more diversity, more, um, more uh, thoughts regarding our perspective different individuals' perspectives and their experiences will not only help boost the technology, um, but also the awareness for other others as well. Yeah, that is very true. I, re I remember being in college and studying uh, a class where a company named their car Nova, and it was marketed to <laughs> Latin America. And so who wants to buy a car that's <laughs> called Nova? And for those that don't speak Spanish, it means it doesn't go or it doesn't run. So <laughs> had there been someone as part of that marketing or branding team that spoke Spanish at least would have probably said, not a good idea. <laughs> so I absolutely agree. Diversity of thought throughout the entire production process is incredibly important, but also even in the marketing and the branding of, of new products and services. Um, with that being said, I'd like to uh, ask one more student who has a question. And that student is Emily Cuadros, Cuadros, I'm sorry, from Dallas, Texas. Emily, are you with us? And if so, can you please unmute your microphone and ask your question? Okay, we'll move on because I, don't, I think Emily um, is having audio issues. So I'll ask the question on her behalf. And her question is, what are some of the skills necessary in order to be successful as an engineer? And I think some of you have touched on this a little bit throughout the presentation, but oftentimes kids or students believe that if they're not great at Spanish or they're not great at, I'm sorry, not Spanish, uh, math or not great at um, science, that a career in engineering is not going to uh, work out for them. And I think someone mentioned this earlier, how they fell the course several times, and here he is, a successful engineer at Raytheon. So anyone would like to speak to that? I can try. Uh, can you guys hear me okay? I try to speak a little louder, maybe. Yeah. We, we oh. can hear you still a little bit muffled, so maybe if you speak a little bit slowly, we might be able to. Okay. Yeah. I think uh, it's, I think looking back, the most important things for me were um, always um, looking to solve problems. When we hire engineers at Raytheon, we're looking for graduates that are excited about solving problems. And that's very important, you know, and that's something you do regardless of what STEM field you may decide to go into. It's about solving problems. And this has been mentioned before, but I think it's so important that I, I think I want to, to mention it uh, again, is um, you always want to be learning and looking for opportunities. And the skills that you learn in those outside opportunities, not just in the class, but in internships or in mentorships, just learning from others, just like you are having an opportunity to, to listen to us today, are very important as well. And sometimes you can take it for granted and think, well, no, like I did when I was in school, I didn't do much of that. I went to all the classes, I did all my homework, but it's very important to gain some other skills as well by mentorships and internships, and never, never give up. I almost uh, quit engineering in college. A lot of people do because they take the first one or two classes in college, and it's difficult, more difficult than they thought. But before you ever decide to give up, 
please reach out. You have a lot of opportunities today that um, we didn't have, have a while ago. SHIP is very active across many, if not almost every campus. You can reach out, reach out to any of us. I, I you know, personally, I, I, you know, give me a call. I, I know that it's very important um, to just stick with it. And that skill, that resilience, sticking with it is important in the workplace too. When you come to work on these complex systems, it's very exciting, but it's also challenging. And one of the things I think STEM graduates, engineers like us do is we persevere, we keep finding solutions. I remember asking my first boss, what happens if you can't solve the problem? Because I was scared that what if I can't come up with something? And his answer was, we always do. That's what we do. We're engineers. And you know, he was right. So um, never give up. And that's a skill, that perseverance. Thank you, Maria. And I, I heard two things in there. I heard resilience, perseverance, and actually one more, um, and, and that is um, overcoming, right? Um, overcoming and not taking no for an answer. And the importance of problem solving and critical thinking skills. I know you students that are on this call right now probably hear your teachers say this a, a lot of the importance of critical thinking skills and problem solving, figuring things out and not giving up until you have. And, and I think that is what really Maria is speaking to. Um, Juan Baena, would you like to add to that before we move on to our next question? Yeah, I can uh, definitely add up uh, briefly. Uh, and I'll just mention this. Um, going through the classes like freshman year sophomore year um, they are difficult but once you get through you almost feel in, in, um, unstoppable because you realize like uh, mario's mentioning the discipline all those factors that you're able to get through this um, and if you're able to do it successfully it's a big accomplishment and then once you get your degree that's the next accomplishment and then once you're an engineer that's the next accomplishment so definitely keeping your head up and pushing through making sure you're strategic about it will will uh, help you help out a lot. Thank you, Juan. You know, I'd like to close by asking all of you, if you had the chance to speak with your 17 year old younger self, what advice would you give them starting with Jasmine? Jasmine, you're on mute. Thanks, Juan. Um, I, I would remind myself que siempre echarle ganas. Um, don't let anything stop you. Same thing with Maria, you know, saying resilience and perseverance is when you are at a crossroads at a branch of some challenges, um, look at what's around you. What are your resources in that moment and make the best of them? Especially now, I think that's very relevant with, uh, with COVID. So, you know, we do what we can with what we have at the time and just get it done. Juan Z? Yeah, um, I would tell my 17 year old self, uh, the present doesn't last forever. Um, sometimes I remember being in high school with drama, with like, oh, I got to do good in school. Um, I wasn't doing all that great in terms of family things but it doesn't last forever. Um, keep pushing through. Um, the future is always brighter once you put in the work. Um, and yet it's not a straight path. I know it sounds all cheesy and stuff. Um, you see those memes of how to get to success and it's ups and downs and, and, tr and trust me, it's, it's, not, it's, it's not a straight line, um, but it's all worth it at the end. Um, I'll quickly kind of say that to my 17 year old self, um, one day you're going to be on an aircraft flying with a laptop on your lap with headphones and a mic talking to ground control and testing your software that you developed. Um, and that's what I do. And I enjoy, enjoy it. And Raytheon is, is that place where I get to do that. So um, that's what I would tell my 17 year old self as a little inspiration. Thank you, Maria. Remind my 17 year old self that um, my family, my parents, my grandparents, they went to a lot of trouble um, for 
blessed to be able to be here and for me to have all the opportunities uh, that I've been able to have. And I think I would go for them even more, you know, and, and recognizing that we are we're very lucky to have this opportunity to pursue our careers and our dreams here. And if Tatiana's go for it, and as my grandmother used to say, para atrás ni para coger impulso. Keep going and don't worry. You know, I remember, you know, suddenly not doing well in a class and thinking the world was over. Keep going. Para atrás ni para coger impulso. Everybody can do it. If I can do it, you can do it too. Uh, the one thing that I would tell my 17-year-old uh, self, uh, there would be two things. The first thing is, like everyone touched upon your why, like why you're doing it, and that emphasis. Um, I'm doing it for my parents, for my friends that have always supported me, um, and that support system, you really want to prove the best you can to your potential. I'm doing that. And the second thing is 17 at the time, that's the time of uh, college applications. Um, I only applied to one school. And just because for me, it was just, I didn't feel too confident. So I would tell myself to um, apply to multiple schools, see what the, it doesn't hurt to, to do it. It's just your time and some, some uh, applications fee, but it's all worth in your interest and you're kind of uh, gambling it, but you'll be surprised to see what comes out of it. Jasmine. Oh, yes, I believe I, I stated my last comments, but you know, I can just go back and, and reiterate too that as everyone was emphasizing at 17 years old, um, you know, I was leaving high school or graduating high school at that time, not, uh, not knowing that engineering was truly going to be my field yet. So, um, you know, don't be too hard on yourself to identify that one degree because in the end, the degree too, uh, you can you can branch off wherever you'd like with as soon as you have your degree. So um, don't be too hard on yourself. Thank you. And I'll close with saying, you know, something similar that my mom always used to say, like Maria's grandmother, palante, para atrás ni para echar impulso, which means keep going. Don't look back, not even to, to uh, go faster. So um, with that, we do have an exit poll. Um, ask one more question of you guys, and then we'll ask for you to remain on turn on your camera so that we can have our screenshot. Thank you, Raytheon. Thank you, Juan. Thank you, Juan Baena. Thank you, Maria. Thank you, Jasmine. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you to our NAV network for joining us today.